my second time here um, in Glenties. I was here um, when the boom was getting more boomier in 2007, and we were trying to, just, trying to decide that time how we were going to spend our millions or billions on the health system. And my debate at that time was um, whether we should uh, have a public or private privatised health care. So obviously that um, debate kind of died at the time of the, uh, the death of the Celtic Tiger, um, I would have argued at that time with Maeve Ann in favour of universal health care, and I, I, I believe that still. Um, the, this is a somewhat more, um, I suppose, a, a scarier time for us. Our, our health system at the time, I was looking over my talk from 2007, and I was talking about the deficiencies within the health system. I nearly actually used the same talk, but it's actually much worse now. Um, the, the system is actually really badly broken now. Um, we, have, we have a lot of problems in our health system and really, we really do need to think about where we are at at these crossroads, about what sort of health care that we want and, and what sort of changes we need to make um, pretty much along the lines of, of that Ruth sketched out a few minutes ago and that, that Maeve Ann so eloquently defined from an economic point of view. I'm, I'm a clinician and I also am a researcher, so I'm going to talk a little bit from the two perspectives I've been... I've been um, I've been a, me a doctor since um, 1983 because I was 12 when I qualified. <laughs> um, so I've been around a long time and, and I've been around the block a long time. I was, I was a, the 11th neurologist appointed in the country in 1996, so we've come a long way. We have 34 neurologists in Ireland now, but it's still not enough. Um, it's the same across the board for all our specialty services. So our health system is broken, um, in case you haven't noticed. Um, you know, we, have, we have a huge problem in the way that we operate a health system, and I think that Maeve Ann demonstrated that very, very effectively. Um, uh, the issue about medical cards, for example, this, this sort of perverse incentive that people have about, med about, why, about the fact that we need to pay uh, for medicine at the point of care, but we don't have to pay in secondary care. And what that does is it, it drives people into the hospitals where it's much more expensive. It's free for a patient to come to my clinic in Beaumont uh, and for me to give them a prescription, but they have to go, they have to pay 60 euro to a GP to get a prescription. That seems to me like a seriously perverse incentive because we have long waiting lists in our neurology clinics, um, which would be, we would be better served shortening those waiting lists by seeing people who have new problems rather than continue to see people who have ongoing problems, but the community-based services are not really sufficient to take back the patients that we see, and the patients are disincentivized to go back into the primary system because they have to pay. So that's a huge perverse incentive. It's one of the problems. Getting medical cards, which are a proportion of our population, about 30%, maybe 40%, are entitled to medical cards. So the people who don't make the very stringent economic criteria, most of my patients that I see, people with motor neuron disease and MS and, and serious neurological or neuromuscular or, or multi-system disease, those patients who don't make the criteria have to basically humiliate themselves in a, in a system that is really person unfriendly, a massive faceless bureaucracy that looks for any number of pieces of documentation that I wouldn't have and I'm at the foot of my health um, to, to enable them to access community-based services that should be, according to WHO, a, a right. So our system is broken, there's no doubt about it. This is just this is an old slide, but it's, it's actually quite relevant still about the, um, the, the sorts of people who come into hospital. We know that 70%, 80% of hospital admissions are medical problems. So hospitals are not for operations. Only 20% of admissions in hospital are for surgery. And the other 80% are people who've got medical problems. And 70% of those are people who have chronic disease, acute exacerbation of chronic disease, people who could be looked after if we had a decent community service. There's also a length, the length of stay. Young people come in and have something wrong with them. They come in to get it fixed. Old people have three times the length of stay compared to young people. These are frail old people. Frailty is not a disease. Frailty is a state of life. But yet we, we sequester these people in our hospitals. So our hospitals mostly treat common chronic conditions and age-related frailty because of this perverse incentive that we have about making people go to hospital when they should be in the community service. 
This is a delayed discharge. I'm sure um, the minister knows uh, these data, uh, but, but they're pretty shocking. So I, I work in Beaumont, uh, which is the second bar there. And um, I looked up the number of beds that we have and, and the proportion of um, people who are delayed discharge, people who, um, who can't go home because there's nowhere for them to go. In the ward that I work on, we, we have six of those at the moment in a 30-bed ward. So on average, that, that's, that's across the board in the Dublin hospitals. The north side of Dublin is a bit worse than the south side, but it's across the country as well. In Dublin, which is where I know best, one in every six beds is blocked because a person can't go home and there's nowhere else to go. That's not what hospitals are for. Hospitals are for acute illnesses, for sick people that we can treat and get them back out into the community where they belong, where people have their health, their social networks and their families. And that's we should be aiming to have a system where the hospitals are for acute management and not to sequester people who shouldn't be there. So the system is broken. Another problem that's happened, and that's happened really acutely since the last time I was here in Glenties, is emigration. This is a huge problem. Our young people are leaving in droves. Uh, this is a dirty little secret in a way. I, I was looking at the news feed from the RTE news uh, uh, network today, and um, there's a shocking figure that 9,000 Irish nurses left the jurisdiction between 2009 and now. We have a, there's, a, there's a news just that there's an incentivization now to bring nurses back. But these are nurses that we let go, people that we, we educated, 9,000 in the last, in, in the last uh, six years. I can tell you that that's the same for young doctors. I can tell you, I work in Trinity. There was a, a, an analysis that was done by the school administrator for the, the medical school in Trinity. And she told me that the top 10% of the top students in Trinity didn't even bother applying for internships in Dublin. That's really scary. That's really frightening. Our top people are leaving. I, I have a research program. I have 30 people in my research program. Every year, I appoint young doctors to work with me to build up their research careers. They do PhDs with me. I didn't hire anybody this year. There was nobody to hire. We have a massive problem. We're investing in these young people. We, we demand huge amounts of them. They're leaving certs. We may have very coveted places in medical school, and our best and brightest are leaving. We have to change that. Our system is broken. Our system is broken. We've tried everything. I'm sorry about the American flag, actually. I didn't notice that until after it. But it's the same. As Maeve said, this is the same across the world. Our system is broken. We've tried everything, and we haven't been able to fix it. The definition by Einstein of insanity is that we keep on doing the same thing over and over again and we expect different results. And I'm afraid there was a mental health um, discussion this morning and I think that um, if, if that's the definition, then we're all guilty as charged, I'm afraid. Um, we, we haven't been able to fix our system. So we have to repurpose our health system. Now, this is a, this is a slide that I used in my last talk in 2007. This is the program for, uh, for development transformation. There's a lovely picture of a chrysalis and then a butterfly. So our health system, you know, caterpillar chicks and turned to butterfly. You can't really read the, uh, this, this slide, the six transformation priorities, but I was looking at them just before I had my talk, and, and actually we ne we've met none of them. There are things like we'll have a really good universal health system, we'll have a primary care system, P a patient's journey will be free and ident will be identifiable, a person when they get a disease will know where they're going with their disease, they'll get expert care, their good, good services, there'll be no waiting lists. None of that has happened. We, we've failed miserably in that transformation program. We've had many previous reports um, since I was appointed in 1996. We've had, we've had all sorts of this. We had the Hanley report before that. We've had many reports about how we should fix our health system. There are some really obvious things that we should do. Um, it's, it's, it's clear, and, and the minister has spoken about this, the age-related frailty should not be in hospital. We need alternatives for looking at this. This is a stage of life. This is not an illness, being frail is not an illness, being frail is part of what's going to happen to all of us as our life expectancy increases. The life expectancy in Ireland for women is now 83 and for men is 81. So we're all consigned to being frail. That doesn't mean we should be in hospital. We should have, really, have community-based services or, or, if necessary, appropriately positioned places for people to go that are dignified, that are not, that, where you don't have to be difficult and demanding to get the sort of care that you should get because you've been a net taxpayer all your life. We know that. We know that we should be doing that. We just haven't done it yet. We also know that, as, as Mayvan very eloquently pointed out from a health economic point of view, I can tell you as a physician this is true, prevention is better than cure. It's much cheaper to prevent disease than to cure disease. Of course we know that. I mean, is it better to be dead 
or to exercise? Well, we know the answer to that. We know that we should be prevented. We should have a system of promoting prevention. These are things we've known for many years. We don't need research to tell us that. We know this. We know that this is a problem. We just haven't really taken our advice. We're very good at giving ourselves advice. We just don't implement it very well. We don't, we're not very good. We don't emphasize it highly enough. So tell me something I don't know. This is a, these are, that's all old hat. We know that. I've known that. So let's really think about how do we really repurpose our health system in a way that's, that's evidence-based and that's appropriate to the society in which we live and to the, the types of illnesses and age-related conditions that we, we, are, that we expect to, to need to support in the future. Well, I have to... I'm not an economist. I'm sorry, my van. This is my... I have two economic slides. Okay. So, so value is outcomes of our cost. And, and so the outcome is what happens to you, and the cost is how you pay for it. And my van um, did, gave, gave us some information about that in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that obviously I, I completely agree with. But I'm going to do it, put a little bit more colour into this because I'm a clinician. So if you look at value over outcome. This is the only economic slide I have, and it's, it's with reference to some that Ruth said earlier as well. So this is kind of a busy slide, but it's in four quadrants, and we're um, conveniently um, um, circled in red. We're the red one there. So we don't spend, this is an old slide, it's 2005, but the, it was published in 2008, it's not that different. So we spend a little bit less uh, on, on our health than other countries, and we have a little, little, little bit less good outcomes. But the, as, as Ruth was saying, that you know, the argument about whether we should see whether we should do Boston or Berlin—it's kind of an old argument. Uh, this is Boston over here. The American health system is really bad. They spend far too much on healthcare—17% of GDP—and they have really bad outcomes. This is just on life expectancy. Now, life expectancy—it's it's because it's an inequitable system. There are other countries that we could emulate up, up in the top corner there, where they spend a little bit less than you would expect on OECD, and they have better outcomes. So we need, so we need to look at what they're doing that we're not doing. So, if you, so that's outcome. To some extent, that's a cost and outcome. That's a graph of cost and outcome. Let's, look, let's try and parse it out a little bit more. And again, this is really, I suppose, a reiteration of May Van's um, talk. So one of the dirty words in Irish healthcare is rationing. We need to ration healthcare. Healthcare has to be rationed. If, if, if we didn't ration healthcare, our entire GDP could go on health because the, the, the potential requirements of health are, are exponential. If we think about, you know, is cosmetic surgery, is that a form of health? Should we, should we um, provide cosmetic surgery as uh, right? You know, there are certain things that we should do. We should have clean water and, and, clean, and sanitation and, and, and good housing. That's part of health in one way. So the part of health where, where we need to ration is what is considered a right, what, what is, you know, appropriate. People shouldn't die of appendicitis anymore. You know, people shouldn't um, get heart, die from, from heart attacks when we can put in stents. So things that... You shouldn't die of diabetes. You, know, you, should, you shouldn't die of the complication of diabetes. So these are things that we should be able to fix, but it's somewhat discretionary. So, so the, the way we ration our health system, this is an argument across the world. Everybody has this argument, how we ration. So there's a pot that is in the public expenditure, and then there's a pot that's discretionary that's elsewhere. Um, and, and as it may be answered, all, many countries, I, I collaborate with many colleagues in Europe, this is an argument across Europe. France spends 70% of GDP on health, so they have a very good health system, but, but they spend too much. So everybody is, is, is discussing this. We have to have this discussion, though. So who do we fund? That's the question about um, medical cards. I believe, and, and, and by virtue of my experience as a doctor for the last 32 years, that head medical cards should be on the basis of need. Of need and, and it's really, it's really um, not acceptable that, that if you have a medical illness that requires integrated care, um, that you have to demonstrate hardship. If you have a medical condition that requires integrated care, you should have a medical card, and that's the bottom line. Everybody who should have access to primary care, to medicine at the point of care, free of charge. That's my, that would be my view on that. What do we support? That's the thing of do we support breast implants or, or cosmetic surgery? And where do we do it? How do we do it? Do we do it in the public private? These are arguments for May Van to, to really parse out what she has done. But they're, they're very real arguments in terms of what um, the health system is expected to deliver and who, what sort of service you need to and how much it's going to cost. These are really important arguments. Just from a clinical, purely clinical point of view, you think about health. Um, about 15% uh, about, um, of, of disease is, is serious or very serious. Um, and the other 85% the other, um, is, 
is either not diagnosed or, or it's not there at all or it's not very serious. So, so this proportion of this sort of health pyramid of, of how ill or well you are, that would be very amenable to the sort of thing that Mayvan was saying around primary care, prevention and early detection. So we need really good primary care service to do that and screening. Screening is very important to identify um, the, the Susie Long's cancer before it became a point where she was at a point of no return. So screening is very important, and we are doing some of that, to be fair, particularly in cancer, which I'll talk, to, talk about in a minute. Then the other, the other um, 20% or so of severe illness, many of those need specialist care, the sort of thing I do. I'm a neurologist. They need hospital care. We need good tertiary hospitals for this sort of thing. And we need something in between for... for um, uh, uh, conditions that are relatively common that require hospitalisation. So it's not that difficult to imagine how it should happen. That's the, the, so the, then Mayvan has given us the cost analysis on that. What about outcomes? Well, death is an outcome and survival, quality of life is a good outcome, but it, or standard, sorry, um, um, life expectancy is a good outcome, quality of life is, is a good outcome as well. So how do we measure outcome? Well, the way we measure outcome is with data. It's, it's information. We need data for us to be able to say anything other than, than death. Is, is, is difficult to access. Death is easy because you can look at death certificates. So data is king here. Now, one of the things that is a problem in Ireland is that we're really bad on data. We're very poor on collection of data. So there are, it's not that we don't collect it. It's that we collect it in a really haphazard way. I just put in, when I was thinking this, I put in databases, Irish Health System, and all these, all these images. It's only about a tenth of what's come up. So there's a really poor integration of our data. So we've loads and loads of people generating data in loads of different ways. Uh, so this is actually, this is a slide that I nicked from a, a, a company that's trying to sell big data. Um, so, so it is, but it's quite similar. We have lots of ways of collecting data. And some of the data get to the likes of the minister and, and some, and, and, or, or to the right person who can maybe make the right decision. And some of the data just falls somewhere in between that trajectory where it's collected and where the decision maker um, is. So what we need to do is we need to find a way of integrating the data that we're collecting and we need to be much more systematic and questioning about the sort of data that we do collect so that the data is formatted in a way that the minister and the ministers and um, the policy makers um, who are generating policy about the direction of health and, and Maeve Ann and her group can use in order to model very much like, like um, um, Dr. Kinsler's talk yesterday about um, a dashboard for our economics. We need a dashboard for health where we can look at all of these things. So we need a, data, a coherent data integration strategy to do this. We need some way of, of integrating the data sets that we have. Now, there are ways that we can learn. The, the, um, there are many problems with the NHS in the, U, in, in the UK, national health system. And if you, go, if you look at you know, their long waiting list to see GPs, it's not an ideal system. There are many problems with the NHS. But one of the things that they have got right is on this. They have developed something called the National Institute of Health Research on NIH or NHS. And as part of the NHS, it was set up by a woman called Sally Davies 10 years ago. And, and what they've done, this is what it looks like. So the patients at the centre, the NHS trusts are part of that. It's, it's all within the framework of, of the Department of Health, and it works as part of the national health system. So, the, so, so it, it's integrated data collection, data management system within the NHS, which can drive data. So what they've done, it's, a, it's, a, it's about 10 years old now. It's beginning to deliver um, it's, it's driving quality care through clinical research. So I just picked out two news examples while I was preparing this talk last week. You can see I, on the 15th, 17th of July. So they've been able to show, for example, that if they have a new policy around hip fractures, they can improve care and have fewer deaths. That's really important if you've got a hip fracture. It's really important for the delivery of care within hospitals. They, they, they found that uh, hospital quality measurements don't give them a good a uh, picture of what's going on there in, in terms of avoidable deaths. Really important. There's a lot of avoidable deaths in the Irish system. How many? We don't know. We don't know how many avoidable deaths because we don't capture that information. We have no way of collecting that information. The UK, they've got a collection of avoidable deaths and they know where the problems are in collecting those data. So we need something like that. Could we have something like that? Well, this is what it would look like because we designed one a couple of years ago. We, it just hasn't been implemented. So there would be a Sally Davis type person. It would, be under, it would be under the umbrella of the Department of Health. It would incorporate the sort of things that Ruth was saying around building research as part of the trajectory or the course of 
the delivery of healthcare research should be fully embedded into that because research allows us to understand what's going on and change things in real time. So we need to have a system built into the structure of our health system that collects data in real time that allows us to commission research in the right sort of areas so that we can change practice and change policy. So that's data-driven healthcare, and we don't have that in Ireland. Now, we don't have that systematically. We do have small oases of data-driven care, and have they made a difference or what? So the National Cancer Registry was set up by Harry Comer in about 1994. It was one of the biggest services that an Irish doctor or an Irish healthcare professional could do to any, any part of the Irish health system. It was set up at, with, with no, very little resourcing, but what it did was it generated data about cancer in Ireland. And the uh, uh, cancer strategy that was initiated by, by Mary Harney uh, could not have operated without the, um, without the, the um, cancer, the National Cancer Registry. So, so, so this is just an example um, of the data that this has generated, just about, about health, about, about, about can breast cancer, for example. So the rates of breast cancer. Out of that, you can track breast cancer, you can look at outcomes, you can do comparative analysis. One of the things that was shown very early on with the data from the cancer industry was that we had really bad outcomes compared to Northern Ireland, where they had a very good system. That drove change. So we now we have a really good cancer strategy. Cancer is one of the successes of the Irish health system. Why? Because we have data. We have other examples. My own research is a motor neuron disease. I run a register for motor neuron disease. We've run it for the last 20 years. 20 years is, is good for these sorts of data. We've been able to map motor neuron disease in Ireland over the last 20 years. This is a corrected map. Um, actually, there's a little hole in Kilkenny, which we're interested in, one up in Donegal, we're interested in why that is. But the point is that we have these data, so we can start looking at outcomes. So we've been able to show, for example, this is a curve where the top curve is survival, the top curve is best and the bottom curve is worst. And we're able to compare people who come to a multidisciplinary clinic, multidisciplinary clinic, this shows that multidisciplinary clinics make a difference. People who come to our multidisciplinary clinic in Bowman live longer by nine months compared to people who don't come to our clinic, which is the bottom. And we do better than Northern Ireland because we did a comparison, comparative analysis with the register in Northern Ireland, which we have to set up. And we showed that people live longer if they come to multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary clinics. That's evidence, that's practice-based evidence, data-driven uh, changes in healthcare. So now we can say to the Department of Health and the HSE, multidisciplinary clinics are really important for rare disease and we should be investing in them. That's, that's research informing how we in enunciate policies for health, and we can, re we can replicate that if we have data in other areas. If we had an Irish NIHO, we could also commission data to maximise value for money, the sort of thing that Maeve Ann is looking for, for the data to show outcome, to demonstrate where we've got, where we've got good value for money. We could develop excellence in healthcare. We could commission research to look at things like hip fractures and how we manage them, or like mortality and morbidity data from hospitals. We could look at whether primary care uh, services work best in, with particular designs, with specific designs. There are many things we could commission to ask very, very important questions about how we should drive healthcare going forward. We could rationalise our research infrastructure. For example, I, I was talking to one of my colleagues. Um, during the week, and I was telling her I was speaking here, and I was telling her about my ideas, our ideas around NIHO, and she said ethics committees are really, really bad. We have every single institution has its own ethics committee. She told me that she did a population-based survey of something recently. She went to 138 different ethics committees, and then she said, no, sorry, it's 138 plus one, because I had to go to Trinity as well. It's 139. Think of all the trees that killed. Anything else. Think of all the time that that wasted. That woman is a really high-powered researcher. All that wasted time. We had a centralised ethics committee to drive research. That would massively improve our output. It would massively uh, simplify how we do research. That's true for any aspect of, 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 of health research that we want to do. We could identify future needs and build efficient services. And we could provide really compelling evidence to rationalise services. We, we, we have um, um, the minister this morning, Minister Lynch, was talking about closing down a, a facility um, for mental health um, in a part of the country. And she was saying there was evidence that the plan was to close it down, but there had been uh, a lot of resistance to closing down the centre. Very understandable resistance. We see this all the time. Um, hospitals that really aren't fit for purpose in the 21st century based on outcome data um, there's a huge resistance locally to closing them down. Why? Because we don't have enough language to tell people about the evidence about why this happens. And I have to say that one of the problems is that we have, 
you know, politicians, local politicians capitalizing on, on, on the politics of protest or the politics of, of dissent rather than taking a proper evidence-based view. That's partly our fault for not giving evidence. This is a, a study from the U.S. showing that the, the death rate from um, esophageal cancer is much higher in hospitals where they, don't do more, where they do less than five a year compared to ones that do more than 30 a year. The same with hip surgery, the same with heart surgery. We know this. There's evidence this is from other countries. We don't. So, so rational, uh, evidence to rational, so we can explain to people why this is really important. At the same time, putting in the appropriate primary care services that are needed so that these people don't feel that they're bereft or that, they've be, that they're, they're the only little bit of health service that they had is being withdrawn. So this has to happen in tandem with building up our primary care services. We also need to promote changes in culture, and this came up this morning as well um, around the issue of clinical governance, and we're really bad at clinical governance. For example, we need to take clinical governance much more seriously. What's that? That's how we practice. That's how we're monitored, how we're held accountable. Whether there's variance in the system, if there's, if there's one um, centre that has um, an outcome or that has an, a, a particular type of activity that, that, for example, is four or five times higher than another area, I'll give you an example of, of on call when I'm on call. There's a difference between when I'm on call and who gets admitted to our service and one of my colleagues who's on call Five times difference. Am I killing people or is he admitting too much? We need to be able to look at those variances. We need to have a governance structure that allows us to do that. We have to move away from this idea that we are um, godlike. Um, we, we, we have to move into this place where, where healthcare professionals are um, clinically autonomous, yes, because we're professionally trained, but we also need to be responsible. We need to be held responsible. We need to learn how to power share. We need to work as members of teams, we don't have all the answers. We need to work with our nursing colleagues, our, our, our nurse practitioner colleagues, our physiotherapy colleagues, occupational therapists. Most diseases we look after, look after now are chronic diseases which require integrated, multidisciplinary care. We have to power share in terms of how that happens. We have to work as teams. Um, one, of the thing, one of the pieces of work that we've done around why people live longer who come to our clinic is not because I'm magic or because I know anything more than my colleagues, it's because we work as a team. The multidisciplinary team is iterative. It's, it's multiple decision-making. The decision is, is centered by the team and not by an individual professional. Teamwork is good for patients. Teamwork is good for care. We need to really promote teamwork. We need to contain costs. I said at the beginning our health costs could be exponential. We need to really encourage audit. Audit is a joke. In, in where I work, people do audit. We're supposed to do audit as part of our professional development. But it's, it's, nobody takes audit seriously. Audit should be a really core part of what we do. And we should be, uh, there should be serious um, uh, uh, repercussions for people who don't engage in audit. It's very important. And we need to engage in patient-oriented research. We also need to move to more of a patient-centered care. Here's my last slide. This is, um, this is what the, now this is the, this is the last but one of the design of the HSE. But where's the patient? There. That little hole, this kind of annoying little sort of roundy thing at the bottom is the patient. So we need to move to a system where the patient is much more at the center of care. Something like an NIHO would actually do that. So thank you very much. The time is now. Thank you.